that you can be there this evening. We're a small number, but a good that can be there anyway. And we're glad if there are those at home listening in. We've got to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we thank you for the promise that says where two or three are gathered together. There I am in the midst. And we praise you and bless you, Heavenly Father, that you come down and that you draw near to your people. You say to us, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So remember us this night, we pray. Come down and bless us and remember us and cause your face to shine upon us and do us good. For our prayers to you are brought in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read the words of a hymn that we would usually sing on um, uh, Easter Sunday. I almost said Christmas Day then, that would be very foolish. But on Easter Sunday, this is a hymn we would normally sing. And I said, uh, just now talking to the, to the boys, I probably sung this hymn for, well, I don't know how many years, but many, many years on, Christmas, on Easter Sunday. And it seems a very strange thing not to, to sing it. 225. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. Sing you heavens and earth reply. Vain the stone, the watch, the seal. Christ has burst the gates of hell. Death in vain forbids his rise. Christ has opened paradise. Lives again our glorious King. Where, O death, is now your sting? Once he died, our souls to save. Where, O victory, O, where your victory, O grave. So we now, where Christ has led, following our exalted head, Made like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Hail the Lord of earth and heaven. Praise to you by both be given. Every knee to you shall bow. Risen Christ, triumphant now. 225. Well, we're going to read God's word there this evening. And it's in John's Gospel. And it's in chapter 11. It's in chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. We had quite a long reading there this morning and we've got quite a long reading there this evening. So that's John's Gospel, chapter 11 and at verse 1. Let us hear God's word. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, of the town of uh, Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. 
Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews, who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not only for that nation, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command 
that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. And we thank God for the reading of his holy word. We'll come back to that very shortly. But before we do that, we're going to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, we're glad to meet in your holy presence. We're glad for that wonderful invitation that goes out to the people of God, that we should gather together, that we should call together upon your name, that we should seek your face, that we should come to this place, O oh God, where that you have made possible for us to meet with God. We thank you for the joy and the delight that belong to Old Testament Israel when they said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up unto the house of the Lord. And we're glad this evening to come and to gather in the house of the Lord. We pray that you would meet with us. We pray that you would have dealings with our hearts. And we pray that you would quicken us in the things of God. We know that in and of our own selves, Heavenly Father, there, there was no life. There was only death. There was nothing of that intimate knowledge of God. Your word reminds us that we knew that God was and we readily acknowledge that. But we didn't have that intimate knowledge of God. We were afar off. We were content to be afar off. We were away from the things of God. We went our own way. We did our own thing. We thought our own thoughts. But we thank you for in your good time and in your wonderful grace you worked in our hearts and you sent forth your Holy Spirit and you quickened us O oh God with a, a sense of guilt and sin and shame you made us to feel our wrong and then wonderfully you brought the glad tidings of the Lord Jesus before us and opened our hearts to see that he is indeed the saviour of sinners and we thank you for wonderful salvation. We own before you this evening, Heavenly Father, we, we'd never have that salvation outside of your grace and mercy. It's that inexplicable move and salvation of God. It's something that we can never explain. Certainly we can never explain it in human terms. It is that you reached out to us, that you loved us. And we realize, oh God, that part of that is that in loving us you gave your very own son for us. We bless you and we praise you and we ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would draw our hearts nearer to you as we meet in your holy presence tonight. We know that so easily we wander away. So easily, O oh God, we, we set our own scheme, we determine our own rules, we set out our own pathway. Lord, forgive and cleanse, we pray that so easily we stray from God. But return us again tonight, we pray, and grant that we may know that full joy of knowing the Lord, and that we may have that wonderful contentment in our boast in him. Not in any righteousness of our own, for that could never be, but in that perfect righteousness of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for him and we pray, O oh God, that he would be our joy and our delight day by day by day. And we ask you that as we come to you tonight and as we look into the words of God and as then we share together around the communion table, that you would come near to us, that you would bless us, that you would remember us, that you would cause your face to shine upon us, that you would do us much and abundantly good. Make this time together to be, as it is intended, the means of grace. That we may know grace upon grace. That we may know ourselves growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That we may better know what it means to walk with God. We commend a new week to you. We pray for every situation in our lives, for the many joys and delights of God. We give you thanks. But we're conscious too that there are different ones with problems and anxieties with worries with heavy burdens to bear and some of those are known here tonight and some of those that they're not known and Lord we pray for each and every one that you would remember those difficulties those trials those heavy burdens that we bear and that we might know heavenly father grace to help in time of need 
We pray your blessing upon all in the congregation and that you would do them good. And we pray for your people scattered across the globe. We recognize tonight that in our own land we are knowing you know, better days in some respects. The virus is still there, but in many ways, oh God, we have so much to be thankful for. For, for there is some kind of an abatement at the moment. We don't, we don't take that for granted, but we thank you for it. But we're conscious there are other lands, some of those are in Europe, um, a number of those are in South America, and then in different parts of the world also, where the virus is very, very busy, and your children are in great difficulty. And we pray, Lord, that you would help them to be wise and that you would deal graciously with them. And we pray for your hand of safekeeping to be upon them. And though we come again, as we've come many times, and we plead with you that through this virus, through this thing, that in the final analysis you have done, that you would cause men and women, boys and girls, to seek after God. Oh, that we may realize how brief life is, how fleeting life is. And oh God, that we may see that we need you. Help us to see the wonderful joy that is to be found in Jesus Christ, in the one who states here that he is the resurrection and the life. Help us, Heavenly Father, tonight as we think about him, that we may joy to know that one who is the resurrection and the life. So, Lord, hear our prayer. Remember, we pray to the ends of the earth and glorify the name of your Son. And would it be the case, O God, that the earth would be filled with the knowledge of God, as the waters cover the sea. These are prayers we offer to you, praying and seeking to your forgiveness and pardon and cleansing and patience and your understanding and your long, long suffering. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we're glad to meet together there this evening. The announcements are fairly simple um, tonight. Um, we're here, we're glad. It's the Lord's Supper. We're glad to be met together. Um, everyone is invited to stay. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you walk with him, if you fear God, then you're most welcome to stay and share in that Lord's Supper with us this evening. It's a very special meal, and we look forward to sharing together very shortly. Um, no prayer meeting and Bible study this week. We usually take a little break there at Easter. I don't think we did last year, but we will this year and just... Uh, take a, a wee breather and maybe uh, you'll be able to do something special with the day. I don't know, the weather is said to be very cold. So we'll, we'll see how we get on. Certainly um, the latter days of the week were wonderful days, weren't they? Um, there's a session prayer meeting that is on Thursday evening, 6.30 on Skype. And we look forward to that. And then that brings us round to the following Sunday, a week today, the Lord's Day. And dare I say normal services at 11.30 in the hall and at 6 o'clock here in church. Those, I think, are all the announcements. Any offerings in the box today go to the Central Fund, but I think I said that last week. We're going to read a hymn there this evening. It's sort of a paraphrase, really, and you'll recognise that it's sort of um, taken, at least in a sense, from um, the book of Job, 234. I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy the blessed assurance gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead, he lives, my everlasting head. He lives triumphant from the grave, he lives eternally to save. He lives all glorious in the sky, he lives exalted there on high. He lives to bless me with his love, and still he pleads for me above. He lives to raise me from the grave and me eternally to save. He lives, my kind, wise, constant friend, who still will keep me to the end. He lives, and while he lives, I'll sing, Jesus, my prophet, priest, and king. He lives, my mansion, to prepare, and he will bring me safely there. He lives, all glory to his name, Jesus, unchangeably the same. And if the, the guiding verse came from Job, well, Sam, Samuel Medley moved on a little bit from Job there, but you can understand why he's saying what he's uh, saying. Well, we gave time this morning to thinking about uh, the three different groups of people that we saw there in Mark's Gospel and in chapter 14 and their reaction really to the cross. 
I want this evening to think about um, the resurrection. But again, to think about it from a slightly different angle there this evening and to think about the resurrection through what happens with Lazarus and with his two sisters here in John's Gospel and chapter 11. The resurrection is, of course, the most glorious Christian truth. Christ died. Of that there can be no doubt. There went out a call for the legs um, of the three, and we mentioned this this morning, who hung there on those three crosses side by side. But there went out a, a cry that their legs should be broken. But not a bone of him was broken in accordance with what was written down in Scripture, because when they came to look at the Lord Jesus Christ, he had already died. And to make sure of that, the Roman centurion, he, he pushes that spear into his side, and out comes blood and water. He was dead. He died as our sacrifice. He died as our substitute. Christ died for our sins. The circumstance was so terrible, it was so awful, that the disciples had long since forsaken him and fled. And we noticed that this morning in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14 and verse 15. Before ever we get into the actual events, um, really, of, of the, the, the day of crucifixion. But his death was as our substitute. And to pick up the language of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was, bru he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed, Isaiah, in chapter 53 and verse 5. But those days leading up to the crucifixion had left a, a doubt in the minds of the disciples. And we spoke about that to some extent this morning. Everything had gone so badly wrong. They'd been warned, repeatedly warned, what was going to happen. But they failed to take it in. And despite the warnings, because they'd failed to take it in, they were unprepared. And when then, eventually, the event comes, it hits them so hard. It wipes them out, we might say, in a more modern parlance. They were in no position to deal with it, let alone take on board that there would be a resurrection. But there was a resurrection. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And the resurrection is the answer. It's the answer to his death. It's the answer to the atonement, for he didn't die for his own sins. He died for our sins, and having made that atonement, he was raised from the dead. The resurrection is the answer to the certainty of who he is. The resurrection is the answer to death itself, our death, my death. Because he lives, I will live also. And the resurrection provides us with the meaning to life, doesn't it? Well, I want to think about the resurrection, but taking it this evening from, um, you know, thinking through what happened here with Lazarus and coming at a different angle this evening. But all the time with that thought of the resurrection very much in the background. So, three little headings. What happened to Lazarus? The strange perplexity. What happened to Lazarus? The strange perplexity. What happened to Lazarus? The supreme power. The supreme power. What happened to Lazarus? The stunning pledge. The stunning pledge. Those three headings. What happened to Lazarus? The strange perplexity. What happened to Lazarus? The supreme power. What happened to Lazarus? The stunning pledge. First of all, what happened to Lazarus? The strange perplexity. The story of Lazarus is, I'm sure, very familiar to probably all, if not all, who are here in the room tonight. Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, were seemingly very close friends to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told there in verse 3, when that uh, this man was sick, uh, that the sisters send a message saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. It's there in verse 3. 
You've got it again in verse 11. These things Jesus said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. He was their friend. Turn the page to verse 33. And we read, Therefore when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now I'm not sure that that's recorded um, anywhere of any other incident. Um, certainly he was troubled in the garden, wasn't he? But I'm not sure that that is actually recorded anywhere else. And certainly verse 35 isn't recorded anywhere else. For we've got the, the two words there, Jesus wept. And in verse 36 we read, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Now make no mistake about it. Lazarus was very near and dear to the Lord Jesus Christ. We may have trouble with that. But if we're going to have trouble with that, we'll probably have trouble with John when he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. So we're probably going to have trouble with that too. Bethany um, was, of course, very close to Jerusalem. And we're told here in the version that we've read from this evening that it was two miles away. Jesus is down in the south. He spent much of his ministry up in the north. He's traveled up and down a little, but he's, he spent much of his ministry up there in the north. He'd come to the people who lived in darkness, hadn't he? And he spent much of his time up there in the north, but as time had gone by, he'd come then down to the south. Luke tells us that he'd set his face to go to Jerusalem. And it was always his purpose to come. He was always coming. He was always coming to the cross. And this incident that we're reading tonight is in very close proximity indeed, of course, to what happened on the cross. This is just shortly before that Passover that we mentioned this morning. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be crucified on the cross. Now, what are we going to say? Well, what happened that day had amazing results because we know, um, staggering as it seems, that the high priest makes a prophecy. Now, I don't think that we can suggest for one moment that he was a godly high priest. And from what we saw this morning, I think we'd struggle to believe that, wouldn't we? That only makes it, you know, all the more alarming to us for his prophecy is real, for he makes this prophecy. He, he says, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider it that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now, this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. It's a staggering um, statement, isn't it? Because I don't think we've any reason to think that he was a godly man. But God speaks through him. And we're told going on from there that from that day on, verse 53, they plotted to put him to death so that Jesus no longer walked openly among them but went from there to the country near to the wilderness to a city called Ephraim and there he remained with his disciples. In this short time, he seems for, you know, to be hiding away um, a, a, a little while. They're, they're seeking Jesus. They sought Jesus and so on. And we're told then in chapter 12, and verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Therefore they made him a supper, and Mary served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And Mary, of course, takes this pound of very costly oil, and she anoints the Lord Jesus for his death. And that sparks Judas then to betray him. Now there's a lot of stuff um, involved here tonight. What happened with Lazarus is an important part of the story. Because what happens with Lazarus does, as I say, urge them on that they would take the life of Jesus and provides the opportunity through Judas that they might indeed be able to take him captive, to capture him. It's an important part of the story. It explains how feelings were so quickly roused to fever pitch in readiness for his death. It's a story that, you know, explains to some extent what happened. But it's also a story that brings to us a certain amount of perplexity. Now, why do I say that? 
Because right at the start of this episode, when Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, he doesn't go immediately. He hangs back. I'm sure I would have talked to you about that before. And I'm sure you're aware of that. At the very moment when you would think that Jesus would go so speedily, so immediately to Bethany. As fast as his legs would take him, he doesn't go. He holds back. Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But Jesus says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. The Son of God may be glorified through it. And he stays two more days in the place where he was. And it seems just so strange, doesn't it? I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine that we probably all spent, um, in different ways, time outdoors. I hope you've spent time outdoors over this whole long year that we've, um, you know, had. Certainly I try to spend that hour um, outdoors and to get into the fresh air. And part of that is the persuasion that there are a lot more vehicles with blue lights and sirens than ever that I'd be conscious of before. Because they, they, even there at tea time tonight, there, 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 there were more. And, and there always seems to be a blue light in the town. And, you know, there always seems to be a siren here and there. And whether it's a fire engine or a police car or an ambulance, there's, there's a siren. It's an awful sound. You think, well, what's happened? It's an awful sound. But it's a wonderful sound. It's a wonderful sound for the people that are waiting for it to come. Isn't it? It's a wonderful sound for those who are waiting for it to come. And what happened to us last year, there was a delay, you know, in in the fire engine arriving. I'm not going to go into the story, but there is. There was a delay. And when the fire engine eventually arrived, we were so relieved for we couldn't go anywhere. And they ended up cutting the roof off the top of the car, as you probably know. The first question I asked the fire officer, who I know, where were you? Where were you? Because in that situation, you're desperately waiting. I don't think I've ever been in that situation for myself. For others, yes. But never in that situation for myself ever before. Where were you? you. And this is a very strange situation, isn't it? Why didn't Jesus put on the blue lights? Why didn't the sirens sound? Why didn't he go as fast as he could? Why did he hold back? But then that truth is to be found in so many of God's dealings, isn't it, with us? And we can often be left asking that question, why does God I can't say for sure whether Samuel Medley bates that hymn that we sung on, on Job's words. You know, I know that my Redeemer lives and so on. I can't be sure, but you'd, you'd certainly think that that's where it comes from. So I would refer to it as a, as a paraphrase. But why did God allow Job to suffer? And you can say that about so many things. Why did God allow the fall? Why did Cain kill his brother? Why is the world drowned in in Noah's flood? Why is Abraham allowed to get together with Hagar? Why do the children of Israel spend 40 years in the wilderness and so on? Why such a long, long wait for the cross? And why his death? And to bring it right up to date, why the virus? Why the virus? Why not just rush and rescue? Isn't it, you know? Why not just rush and rescue? There's a strange perplexity there for us. But here's the reminder that God does all things well. And we have to hold on to that truth, don't we? We have to hold on to that truth. Truly God is good to Israel. There are many strange perplexities in your life, in my life, in the life of God's people, in the life of God's people down the history of time. Many, many strange perplexities. 
a strange perplexity that the Son of God should be put to death on the cross in such a vile and hideous way. What a strange perplexity. What a strange perplexity when we think of Lazarus. What happened to Lazarus? The strange perplexity. But what happened to Lazarus? The supreme power. The supreme power. So the emergency services rush to the rescue and they get to cross the red lights and the traffic pulls over. Don't you? What do you do? How do you react? You know, when you, you hear the siren, what do you do? Well, I can tell you the window goes down in my car. If you've been with me in my car and you, you hear a siren, the window will go down. I'll be looking this way, that way and every way because I just want to help them. I just want to get out of the way. I want to do my part. Whatever I can do, get out of the way. Make sure they have a free run. That's what I'll do. You'll see it every time. Do the same. You want them to do what they, they can. You're, you're sort of urging them on. You want to see that ambulance. You want to see that fire engine get to its destination as quickly as it can. You've no idea where it's going. But you want them to get there. Jesus was urged on here, but he didn't go. Until he knew that Lazarus was dead. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Imagine, you know, the scene. Sometimes you, you get one of those paramedic cars and they can sit in different places in the town, but oftentimes they'll sit on the front of the fire, you know, fire service there, the, the, the bit of um, ground there in front of the, the fire. They'll, they'll, they'll sit there, and they're obviously waiting for a call, and something will happen, and so on. And well, that's the place I most often see them in town if they're, they're not actually on the move. You see them sitting there and waiting for something to happen. But imagine the call comes in, and they need to go, and they're supposed to get there first. They're supposed to be there before the ambulance crew. But the paramedic is taking a tea break. And he says, oh, I'll get there shortly. I'll get there shortly. And he's taking his tea break and he's enjoying himself. And he's not in a rush. And he lets the situation worsen. And he leaves the patient teetering on death. Because he reasons in his head, well, if I get there a bit later, I'll be able to demonstrate my skills all the more. What a strange thing that would be. But the, the, the difference here is that we're dealing with God. The cross is about the justice of God, but the cross is about the power of God, isn't it? How could God let it be that his son, according to human flesh, should die on the cross? How could God let it be that death, the punishment for sin, the consequence of sin, should be the lot of the Lord Jesus Christ? How could it be that those venomous Jewish leaders, together with the crowds that they'd whipped up, how could it be that they're allowed to win through, that they succeed in their planning, and that the Prince of Life is put to death? The one who is the Alpha and the Omega, his life is snuffed out. How could that be? How could it be that the one who turned water into wine, who had caused the lame to walk, who had given the blind to see? How could it be that the one who'd fed the 5,000 with those five loaves and two little fishes, who'd spoken to the winds and the waves and said, peace, be still, and the, waves and the, the wind and the waves obeyed him? How could it be that he should be put to death? How could he lose? Who should only win? It's part of the mystery of God's plan, isn't it? It's part of the mystery of God's plan. Acts in chapter 15 and verse 18. And it says this, it says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning. I don't know if you've got plans for this week. Got plans for this week? I think we've got one or two little plans for this week. Things we're hoping to do. Will they come off? Will your plans come off? Will what you're hoping to do, will it come off? Will you manage to do it? 
got a bit of painting outside to do. They said to me, I don't know, with the weather, we'll be doing that painting. I don't know. Not sure what's going to happen. Can't tell, can we? We don't know what a day is going to bring forth, let alone a week. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning, says Acts 15 and verse 18. And it's only known unto God. The cross, the resurrection, the ascension into glory and being seated at the Father's right hand. His coming again. There's an element here of mystery, isn't there? There's an element of mystery. But in the resurrection, in Christ's resurrection, and even in what happened here in Lazarus, we have the reassurance that all is well. Because he raises him from the dead and he raises his son from the dead. Here is the supreme power of God. Dear friend, it's in the cross, but it's in the resurrection, isn't it? And it's in the resurrection that we have that sort of ultimate answer, really. We glory in the cross, and we rejoice in the, in the cross. But in the resurrection, we see that death can't hold him. Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 14, If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. There's nothing to it. We're just sad people sitting in a building on a Sunday night. Going through some pointless exercise. And the world out there is right. But the world out there is wrong. Because he did rise. He did rise. Lazarus was to rise from the dead. And our Lord Jesus Christ was to rise from the dead. We read further down in that chapter, at verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. What a pitiable lot we'd be. But now Christ is risen from the dead. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You see, it's the key to everything, isn't it? It's the key to everything. He did die, but he rose again. It's there down in verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And we can be sure of him and of his supreme power. Dear friend, this is the answer, isn't it? This is the answer. Do we sometimes, you know, totter a bit in the Christian life? If we're going to be honest, do we sometimes wonder a little bit about the Christian life? The momentary doubts, you know, sometimes come in. I think we'd have to be very strong to say that that never happens. Wouldn't we? The momentary doubts sometimes come in. Because sometimes, you know, in our minds we begin to wonder about the meaning of life after all. And sometimes it all begins to seem a little bit meaningless. Well, here's the meaning to life. That life doesn't end in death. It ends for those who are resting and trusting in Jesus, in eternal life. What happened to Lazarus? The strange perplexity. What happened to Lazarus? The supreme power. But what happened to Lazarus? The stunning pledge. What was involved in this whole episode with Lazarus? Well, there's quite a bit here and stuff that I'm not going to go into tonight. If we were simply coming at this passage and thinking about Lazarus, I'd take it in a very different way. But we're trying to think about Lazarus and we're trying to think beyond Lazarus and to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. There's quite a bit here tonight. But part of this and part of the episode of Lazarus is that what we have in him is a pledge. Why did Lazarus have to die? only to be raised four days later. It was to leave the people of God with a pledge, a reassurance, a help, a comfort. 
It was to get them through the next few days. It ought to have left the disciples with the reassurance that though the Lord Jesus Christ die, as he had said that he would, he would be raised again, as he said he would. It was to get them through the next few days. It was to get them through the awfulness of the cross. It was to get them through the injustice of the cross, the unfairness of the cross. It was to get them through the grief and disappointment of it all. It was the demonstration of his word. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. It was special to that time. It was an important help to them. But it's still a massive help to us. You see, does life sometimes seem scary? Does life sometimes seem out of control? Does life sometimes seem pointless? Do the wicked, does unrighteousness and unfairness, does cheating, does fast dealing, does wrong seem to prosper? And the answer to that question, I think, is yes. And sometimes it eats away at our faith and sometimes it makes us question. Sometimes it makes us worry. Does it cast doubt on the point, the meaning of life? Well, it does. Does God not seem to answer? Did Jesus not seem to answer? You know, the emergency call goes in. That Jesus should come and he doesn't come. And a few days go by. And did it not feel like that for the disciples when he died on the cross? Days go by. Days go by. Does the world, the crowd, seem to have the upper hand when they cry out, where is their God? Why don't the blue lights flash? And why doesn't the siren sound? Here in Lazarus, here in the resurrection, is the stunning, the wonderful reassurance that God has it all, all strange and perplexing, as it may seem, in his hand. And it may be your situation tonight that you're perplexed. Or it may be your situation that in a few weeks time you're perplexed. Or in a few months time you're perplexed. But at some stage in life we all find ourselves perplexed. Christians find themselves perplexed. What a wonderful reassurance Lazarus was intended to be. If only they grasped the message. What wonderful comfort they would have known. And what wonderful comfort we can know too. That's the point, isn't it? And go further, because it does go further, a lot further. What a wonderful reassurance we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. Because, you see, it sorts it all out. Yeah. We're on the winning side. You know, here we are, tennis season. We're almost ready to get a nod. That's good. Tennis season almost ready. And you go out and you play tennis or they go out and play football or you go and play whatever it is that you play. And you've got to sort of believe, though it's against all the odds, for me these days anyway, when it comes to tennis, that you could possibly win. You know? Otherwise you're going to throw it all in the air, aren't you? So here's the football team, and they've lost heart. This sometimes happens, doesn't it, to football teams? Sometimes it's, you know, the best of football teams. But for some strange reason, that's the nature of sport, isn't it? And they, they lose heart, and they come to this particular match, and they've lost heart... And though they're the best football team, they lose to people who are far weaker than them. The same happens sometimes, you know, in playing 
tennis, doesn't it? And whatever you play, that, that happens. There's a sense in which you, you need to believe that you can win if you're going to give it your all. There's a sense in which you need to know that you're on the winning side. That this isn't pointless. This isn't a waste of time. There's a sense in which we need to know that for the Christian life, isn't it? We need to know that we're on the winning side. That's why you've got that verse at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It always seems such a strange way to sum up what Paul has been talking about. He's been talking about the resurrection. It seems very strange that Paul should have to talk about the resurrection in such detail anyway in 1 Corinthians. But 1 Corinthians brings a lot of strange things with it. But to talk about the resurrection in such detail seems very strange. But then he ends in this way, doesn't he, in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. We're not on the losing side. We're on the winning side. We're on the glory side. We're on the winning side. Now, does that urge us to sit back? You say, well, we've won. We don't need to play the game. I don't need to pick my tennis racket up. I don't need to put my football boots on. We've won. That's not what Paul says. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. You need to play. Be immovable. Always abounding. You need to play the game, he says. You need to be steadfast. You need to be immovable. You need always to be abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You're on the winning side. It's the secret, really, to enduring in the Christian life. Otherwise, you'd give up. If you begin to think that you're on the losing side, what are you going to do? You say, well, there's no point because I'm going to lose anyway. What's the point? What's the point? I've missed the volleyball for a year. It's a tragedy. Tragedy, John. No volleyball for a year. Sometimes when the teams are set up in volleyball, you know, there are certain... Mm -hmm, there are certain ties, let me put it like that, without going into the details here this evening. And, and certain parties want to play together. And sometimes we try and jiggle the teams around. Don't we, John, to make sure that it's fair? Don't we try and do that, John? Don't you see me standing there, John? Now, come on, John. You're my, you're my witness tonight. Do you not see me standing there and trying to juggle the teams so that, you know, the team that's been winning for the last few weeks actually loses? We're not going to throw it. But we're willing to lose. If you're on the losing side all the time, you give up, don't you? You don't play. You don't play. Dear Christian friend, you and I are on the winning side. We're on the winning side. And we must never give up. Life comes with its disappointments. Life comes with its difficulties. Life comes with its perplexities. But we must never give up. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Imagine had the disciples taken on board that message of Lazarus. They didn't. They didn't. But they should have done. Let's be careful to take on board the message of Lazarus, but of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll sing it in the words of the hymn we're about to sing 231 though in the grave he lay Jesus my saviour waiting the coming day Jesus my Lord 231 
God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful victory of the cross and of the resurrection, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. We thank you for this wonderful pledge and promise to us. We thank you that one day he's coming and that he's coming for us and that we should be in glory. And help us, Lord, we pray in this difficult world situation in which we find ourselves and in the the midst of an earthly pilgrimage with its many, many disappointments and the power of sin and guilt and wrong all around us, Heavenly Father, that we may know that we're on that conquering victory side and that we may be sure that our Saviour who died for us will come again for us. Deal graciously with us as we further wait upon you now for Jesus' sake. Amen.